we believe that being a defender requires more than building shooting skills on a range. It's also a development of the heart, mind, body, and spirit. Join us as we explore what it truly means to be a defender in your training and in your everyday life. Welcome to Defenders Live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Defenders Live. I am your host, Laura Thorson, and I'm so glad to be with you again on a Wednesday evening. Um, we cannot believe it here, but it is November 1st. I don't know if you guys have uh, come around to that or not, but that means pretty soon it will be Thanksgiving and then Christmas and then the new year. I'm not ready yet, but um, here we are. So thank you for tuning in tonight. I'm really excited to have Mr. Chuck Haggard on tonight. We're going to be talking about all things self-defense and um, Chuck has an extensive background in law enforcement and as a defensive trainer. We're so, so fortunate to have him with us tonight. So I'm going to not do a ton of talking and we're going to get right to the interview here shortly. But first of all, I want to thank all of you for attending tonight. If you're new or watching this as a replay, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Please drop in the comments where you're watching from. We want to hear from you tonight. A um, few announcements really quickly before I introduce Mr. Chuck Haggard. We are going to have a live Q&A towards the end of the broadcast. So if you guys have a question pop in your head while Chuck is talking, um, just put those in the comments and we'll gather those at the end of the broadcast and uh, he will answer those for you. So be ready for that. And also, quick reminder, if you want to be notified about these broadcasts, about what's coming up and who's coming up, please go to defenders-live.com and go to the bottom of the homepage and put in your email address so I can keep in contact with you. We also have a Facebook group, um, a private Defenders Live Facebook group, but I've noticed that the reach is not very good on that group when I put a post up. So if you really uh, want me to get in touch with you, that would be the way to do it. Get on that email list. Um, Adam Winch, the founder of Defenders USA, is behind the scenes helping me tonight. Thank God I need all the help I can get. So if you see him pop on the screen from time to time, uh, don't be alarmed. And you're muted, so nobody knows what that is, Adam. What is that? Explain it. You've done that two or it's three times, screen. and I missed it every time. It's the screaming goat. If, if you've trained with me, you know what it is. <laughs> okay, inside joke. All right, the screaming goat. <laughs> see, this is what I deal with. So just get used to it, right? So if you see him just pop in on the screen, no big deal. That's just how Adam rolls. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'll just leave that alone. All right, so let's get right into the interview with Chuck. Uh, Chuck Haggard is the founder of Agile Training and Consulting. He's been active in private defensive training throughout his long career in urban law enforcement. After 35 years in law enforcement, 28 of which was a steady upward progression through the ranks of the Topeka Police Department, he ventured out on his own to pursue private training on a more regular basis. Chuck maintains his post-certification and stays active in the law enforcement community, but he now devotes even more time to tra training other police officers, military personnel, security forces, and private citizens on the art and science of personal defense. Chuck is certified as a civilian and law enforcement trainer on various weapon systems, including pistol, shotgun, rifle, carbine, OC, baton, and taser. He's also skilled and experienced at teaching weapon retention, disarming, and other empty hand techniques. He enjoys teaching and is proud to be able to contribute to this nation's widespread community of responsible, law-abiding advocates of self-defense. Wow. And we've got a lot to go over tonight. So let's bring on Mr. Chuck Haggard. Hey, Chuck. Hi, how you doing? Great. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that the mic is working and all as well. So we're good. We're good to go. Let's rock and roll. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I have so many questions, um, and I'll do my best to um, make them as concise as I can. But first, let's start off with what did I miss in the bio? Did I miss anything? Do we need to flesh anything out? 
that's a lot of experience um, that you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, I'm kind of ostentatious, so I think we should just leave it at that. Okay. All right. Well, I opened the door in case you wanted to walk through it. Now, second thing before we move on, it's kind of funny, but not funny, is why does everybody in, on the internet call you le the legendary Chuck Haggard? Where so, did that come from? Uh, William April, my friend William April, he was one of the, uh, I met him <clears throat> through Craig Douglas of uh, Shivworks. And uh, William was one of the Shivworks Collective. Uh, Ham Craig, Larry Lindemann, Paul Sharp, uh, you know, the the late Paul Gomez, uh, a couple other guys that uh, um, were all involved in that. But in this case, William, the first Range Master Tactical Conference that I attended down in Oklahoma where I'd met, um, like I'd never met Craig before, or Paul Gomez, a bunch of other people, Tom Gibbons, uh, and... Uh, Unfortunately, several other guys that, that are no longer with us, like Tom Green and uh, William. And uh, during the course of that uh, event, William, because uh, I was most recently, although I wasn't even born in the U.S. and I'm, I'm living in a lot of places because my dad was in the Army, uh, because I was from Kansas and that's where like Dodge City and things like that, you know, Wyatt Earp was active oh, here and things like that. Yeah. Uh, he dubbed me the legendary lawman, Marshall Chuck Haggard. Uh, and then that stuck. Uh, okay. And uh, it's it's been with me ever since. I always, always said I would get William back. And uh, he left us before I got a chance to do that. So it looks like he won. Uh, that's, a, that's a guy that if... Uh, if no one's ever watched his videos or read any of his stuff, William April was one of the guys that I listened to a lot. He's a 90 pound brain, super, super smart guy. Uh, started out in law enforcement, became a psychiatrist, uh, did a lot of things like, you know, the kind of people that profile serial killers or, you know, interview homicide suspects to find out what makes them tick and how long they should stay in prison and stuff like that. William was one of those guys. And he very famously said, they don't think like us. They don't think like you. Um, trying to get people past the idea that, um, you know, somebody who's a violent criminal actor that you can expect any mercy from or for them to think like you or to use the, the same sorts of morals and, and thought processes that, that regular people might. So, yeah, that's a I used to talk to William a couple of times a week and he's somebody I dearly miss. Wow. But, yeah, that's where that came from. Well, I'm glad I asked because there's a whole story behind it and I didn't realize that. Yeah. And he used to correct time. people on the internet. They'd be like, it's Marshall Haggard. And he'd interject into like a Facebook conversation or something and be like, no, it's the <laughs> legendary lawman, Marshall the Chuck. Legendary oh, see, yeah. and Adam put that at the bottom of the screen too, because he knew that. And I didn't know that. So see, he got it right. That's I've awesome. had people think that I'd uh, work for the Marshall Service, which I've been a cop a long time, but I've never worked for the Marshall Service. Uh, things like that. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Great. All right. So, oh man, where to go with you? I mean, there's so many, so many directions here. Okay. Just to preface here. So you've been in law enforcement for over three decades, which is wild to me. Um, I'm working on it. I'll, I'm, I'm almost, I'll be on, I'll be working on my 36th year here pretty quick. Why have you stayed in law enforcement for so long? <laughs> William also used to tell me that I was really bad at retiring, uh, which <laughs> I am. So but I did. Why? I want to know did, why, Chuck. Um, I really enjoy it. I like working at that law enforcement at its heart is a people person type of a uh, type of thing. I'm um, also an unmedicated ADD kid and kind of an adrenaline junkie. Uh, I don't, I don't say that jokingly. I'm literally an unmedicated ADD kid. Uh, I think a lot of ADD kids are, are drawn to action adventure type 
you know, fire service, uh, smoke jumpers, military, uh, police, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so it gives me a lot of satisfaction dealing with, dealing with people, helping people out. I've been involved in all kinds of, uh, police work gives you what I like to call compressed human experience. You'll see things once in a lifetime events over and over and over again. Uh, and you'll, you'll see things that other people don't see, uh, often multiple times. And, uh, yeah. So I, I like helping people. I think it's where my gifts are at. Uh, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not a rocket surgeon because, uh, you know, that's, I think we should go where our strong gifts are at and, uh, that I'm, I'm blessed that, that I've been, have the, I think I've got the skills and, and the mindset and things like that to uh, do well in this job that, uh, I've been allowed to, to be a part of for a very long time. Is that why you got into it to begin with was the the adrenaline and the, <laughs> so, I mean, so no, um, back in the eighties. So I first went, I was 17 when I first went into the military in 1982. And, uh, my, uh, my dad was career army. He was a Korea vet and Vietnam vet, multiple tours in Vietnam, uh, saw heavy combat in Korea and Vietnam. Uh, he did 27 years in the army. And so that's what I grew up with. And he, at the end of his, had, through Vietnam, uh, he segued from infantry to uh, air crew. He was a helicopter crewman. And uh, so I grew up around military air bases, Army air bases all the time. So I wanted to do one of two things, be special operations or I wanted to fly uh, covert gunships. And then back then, before things like LASIK and PRK and that sort of thing, they uh, the Army said, that to be a helicopter pilot, it was 2020 uncorrected, no exceptions, no waivers. So couldn't do that. And then uh, in my file, when I was at uh, Fort Knox going through basic and AIT, they marked me down for exercise induced asthma uh, because I had uh, held an asthma attack there that summer uh, in the middle of one of my runs. And uh, that led to uh, if you want to do anything with special operations they were like yeah thanks for your interest but uh you know we're not we're not interested and then back then people were joining the military uh they they were over capacity for uh, so they were rifting people out just like they had so many people trying to get into the army because it was still a thing that people did that uh they could they could pick and choose so i ended up uh, doing national guard as a part-time thing and then law enforcement as a full-time thing so yeah it's kind of kind of a accidental thing actually how i ended up there and you said that one of the things that you like the most about police work is the human interaction is mm -hmm. that sometimes also the thing you dislike the most i mean you, Could it be <laughs> certain so, humans maybe i don't know so you see you see the best of people you see the the worst of people uh you you see all kinds of you see people literally at their best and at their worst um mm. police work has led me to meet some of the finest human beings uh on the planet the as, as good a people as you would ever want to know and then some of the worst human beings on the planet uh mm. people that you would never want to meet and so the, the way I look at it is uh, those people would be there, whether I met them or not. Uh, and then it gave me a, a venue to both meet them. And then sometimes it was the bad guys to do something about it. So I think we're all there. The, the con I'm very comfortable with the concept that I'm very, that there's, there's good and evil. It exists in the world. And uh, you know, the old, the, the old saying that's attributed to Edmund Burke, uh, you know, all that's necessary for uh, evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. And uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the Bible verse that's out there that's, uh, the short version is, who are you going to send? Uh, here I am, send me. Yeah, I've heard that before. Uh, I think, uh, I'm another trainer. <laughs> I think that, uh, I think people need to step up. And this is, you know, where my gifts led me. So um, mm -hmm. that's the path I've gone. And is that why you became an instructor as well? 
So <laughs> my, uh, my dad was a sniper, uh, saw a lot of heavy combat, was a Camp Perry shooter and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, really good shot, wasn't that great an instructor, but he did teach me how to shoot rifles extremely well, extremely well. So when I was in the uh, Army and then the Army Guard, uh, when <laughs> because I was typically the best shot in the unit at that time, when we would go do qualifications, things like that, I would, you know, pass on my first try. And then I remember my sergeant saying, hey, you know, like Bob over here is having trouble. Go help him out. And like, what, what is 18 year old me supposed to do? You know, like, uh, I don't know, shoot better, uh, try to shoot. Like I was shooting, like how to, how do you, how do you get this across to other people? Mm -hmm. And I did my best, but I felt woefully inadequate. And then I got into police work. Um, I, uh, was, was also pretty young. And then uh, 22, 23 year old me was like, man, a uh, couple of things. One was that uh, my training in the academy, I believe was woefully inadequate. And then I had read a lot of, uh, some of my heroes were uh, Moss Ayub, uh, Jim Cirillo, Evan Marshall, uh, Jeff Cooper, a uh, bunch of other guys, uh, articles that I read. And you know, some of the advice that I took, like with Moss Ayub, uh, counsel people to get uh, instructor certifications so that you could be your own expert witness. So that seemed like a really great idea to me uh, for a couple of reasons. So one uh, one of the reasons I did it was I figured if I went to an instructor level class that I was going to get the best, more gooder training and I would be better prepared for the street because I felt woefully inadequate doing that. And then I wanted to be a firearms instructor because I was still trying to, you know, go help out Bob. And I wanted to do a better job of that. And so I got into a path of being a, being a training junkie and throughout my police career uh, so that I could one, improve the program that we had and I could live longer Then I could help all the guys that I was working with who wanted to train. Eventually, I became a trainer for the department officially, firearms instructor, tactics instructor, defensive tactics, uh, everything. <laughs> at, at one point, I joke, I was uh, certified to teach everything from verbal judo to sniper rifles. Um, like I've been to submachine gun uh, instructor training. Uh, uh, I've been to Army sniper school, a, a wide variety of firearms instructor schools. I am still involved with National Law Enforcement Training Center out of Kansas City, where uh, all we do is teach reasonable use of force and what's commonly called defensive tactics or, or physical control tactics like handcuffing, ground fighting, neck restraint, baton use, uh, OC spray, uh, arrest and control techniques, things like that. And our entire uh, purpose for existence is to create an instructor. So I'm an instructor trainer in that capacity in a law enforcement mm -hmm. capacity. And uh, so one of the reasons I got involved in that is, again, uh, my training at my department was woefully inadequate. So I think uh, you can't just complain about stuff. You got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have, oh man, I, as you're talking, I'm like, oh man, which question do I want to ask next? <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you, you touched on so many things that I could go almost any direction here. But as an instructor, um, let's start with this. Let's start with, you said that a lot of times when we were talking on the phone the other day, you said that you, you have to fix a lot of mistakes with people, with, with working with trainers that uh, don't have a lot of experience themselves or haven't done or worked with a lot of other instructors themselves. Like they're, they haven't become a well-rounded shooter themselves. And a lot of times are just regurgitating information um, to their students and with good intention. We're not knocking people for doing their best mm -hmm. out there, right? But what are some of those common common mistakes that you see that you end up having to correct on people that are getting taught on with those lower level trainers? So, uh, and I'm trying to remember back to a bunch of, we talked about a bunch of stuff on the phone oh, yeah. uh, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday. Um, yeah. and, uh, so one of the things I see is a real problem and this has been a real 
almost a plague in the law enforcement community. And because training has become more of a thing in the non-law enforcement world, like concealed carry, uh, what Pat Rogers used to call average earth people world, uh, is that there's a lot of shake and bake instructors. So in the law enforcement community, you might have a cop has an interest in shooting and, uh, you know, they, they might be a pretty decent shot, but what I find is most cops don't really know what good is. Like they, they may be a big fish in a small pond kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then they go to a, a firearms instructor school, maybe a state uh, academy based thing, which most states have, or the NRA school. Uh, like, like I have been to NRA. <laughs> the first time I went, it was a revolver and shotgun uh, combination course. And then uh, semi-auto pistol, submachine gun, tactical rifle, or patrol rifle, mm -hmm. tactical shooting, things like that. So been through all those courses with the NRA. But the basic course, you're there for five days. It's 44 contact hours, I think it was, if I remember right. And then, bam, you're an instructor. So that really doesn't give you a depth or breadth of knowledge and shooting, especially if you have a guy that's an instructor who has only been through the training that his department puts on. And now he's been through a shake and bake firearms instructor course. And then they are teaching people and they're in service or their academy. That's in no way giving anybody any expertise. Uh, typically, you don't see guys like that competitive uh, at, at any rate. Bullseye, PPC, USPSA, IDPA, typically they're, they're not competitors. And in my, what I found is they're often not high-level shooters. And so I'm picking on the law enforcement community because I know quite a bit about it. And I've, I've seen, you know, like I, I, one of my hobbies was when I would travel, I would go look at other people's programs, their ranges, talk to people, do ride-alongs with other departments, things like that. And I've been to a wide variety of places um, and seeing how they do business because I'm always looking for a better idea. Uh, and everything I'm saying about the law enforcement community and law enforcement training, it applies, but it also applies to the, the non-law enforcement concealed carry firearms training world, uh, probably to a greater degree in that too many instructors go to instructor school and then they have the, I'm an instructor t-shirt and then they, that's it. They really don't work past that point. They don't attend professional Things like, uh, you know, in in the law enforcement world, we have a ILFE, International Association of Law Enforcement Firearms Instructors, uh, or ILEDA, or NTOA, or something like that. So they don't, they don't. Most people don't attend big conferences, network with other instructors. Uh, they don't compete for the most part. So when you run up in, in when you're on the range with like a U, a legit USPSA Grandmaster, you realize that man, uh, you know, the first time I did that back in the eighties and I shot an El Prez and I was pretty proud of myself because I always read Jeff Cooper said, if you shoot an El Prez and under 10, you're doing pretty good. So I was doing pretty good because I had that thing in like 8.2 and I wish I could remember the gentleman's name who was a, he's a USPSA GM and he shot it in like 3.9, you know, and of course he was shooting a race gun and I was shooting my duty gun, but that guy was done with the entire course before I got the first six shots off when you look at the timer. So it gave me a real sense of what good looks like, what human beings can do with pistols. And if you don't get, if, if you're a big shit, fish in a small pond, then yeah, that that's, but you really need to broaden your horizons. Mm -hmm. Too many people get that instructor certificate and park and then they regurgitate the same stuff over and over again. Uh, I like to tell people that you either have to be training all the time, you have to continue to improve your skills, which are evolving, or you're stagnant. And with water, we know what happens when you're not fulling. You're stagnant, you get kind of mossy, algae grows, you start to smell bad. That's <laughs> not a good place to be. So uh, the, what, what I, when I, I deal with people constantly, and I, I try to be you know, not to step on toes and things like that. But when I see gross errors that they're doing that they tell me, well, you know, this instructor taught me this like and this what? instructor taught me that. Give me an uh, example. Uh, like I, I had a lady when I was, I was training out of town. I had a lady at a range where she was basically doing the old cup and saucer, like the teacup oh, type grip. Yeah. Oh, well, I was taught to do that. 
take a deep breath, say something nice, uh, show her how to fix it. And then uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm on the verge of uh, a jihad with the state academy of my state because the firearms instructors down there force people to pin the trigger and then ride the reset and pin the trigger and ride the reset. And what I find that's is why uh, that's not a good idea. I well, for a lot of reasons. Reason. One, yeah. the idea that you're going to pin the trigger, milk the reset out till it just clicks, and that's somehow going to be better because you didn't let the trigger all the way out uh, causes a couple problems. I could show you videos if I had, you know, if I was one of those internet gurus uh, of officers getting trigger freeze. You ever you ever tried to shoot real fast and all of a sudden your gun's not going off because you didn't allow it to re actually reset. Well, if you're training yourself to just barely let it reset, what happens under stress is you pin that trigger and you get trigger freeze. Uh, I, could, I could show you a particular video of a trooper he gets shot on a car stop and he's backing up. He gets one round off, blows the mirror off the car, misses the bad guy, tries to get a, another shot off. And you see him on, the, on the, the body cam look at his gun like it's betrayed him. And then he dashes wow. on camera. And what happened was he had got one shot off and not let the gun reset. And he's trying to make he's trying to make it go, and it's not going to go. So that that's a problem. The other problem I find is people get so mentally focused on how to let the trigger reset, uh, especially like on police qualification courses, because you only have a certain amount of time for a certain amount of shots. So people get this idea of I got to get my shots off instead of I got to get my hits. So they'll be worried about getting that click, and then they wham the trigger. Then they'll milk the reset and then they'll wham the trigger again. So over and over and over again, they're missing, right? Uh, does, with your knowledge of firearms, does how you let go of the trigger help you put bullets accurately in the target? Or is it how you bring the trigger to the rear that assists you in putting bullets accurately in the target? Yeah, it's crossing the trigger. Chuck, I just saw that comment. Is it your birthday? Do we need to sing to you tonight? <laughs> what are you, 38 tonight? Something. <laughs> that's funny because Sherman, uh, my friend, Jim, my good friend Sherman House said, hey, uh, uh, happy 38th birthday. No, I'm, I'm 59. Oh, that's funny. That's funny because my dad said he quit having birthdays after 38. So I just assume everybody's 38. Yeah, I uh, I'm I'm 59 now. Um, Adam, I'm glad you're on the screen so you can sing to him. So go ahead. Oh heavens no! Hey Chuck, <laughs> so so you were talking about a couple of different things that are of interest to me. One, you were talking about the one where the trooper pinned the trigger to the rear. You know, mm -hmm. one hit the hit the hit the mirror on the car, then couldn't get the next shot off because he pinned the trigger to the rear. And for Mon uh, for Laura, just so you know, that actually happened in Montana. Um, Did it? so look, yeah, look that really? up on the internet. Yeah. It's, it's so, a fantastic video. The one I'm me. referencing was in, uh, the one I'm referencing was in Washington state. Ah, okay. So okay. when I say it happens, I don't mean once no, oh, this, no. this isn't a black swan event. This is, this is stuff that happens. Yeah. And, and unfortunately it's trained all the time by all the police departments, right? My PD, also train the same thing, right? And and it's an unfortunate thing. The other thing is, Chuck, if you don't mind if I jump in here, is no. that you were talking about the shake and bake instructors, and and that's a real passion of mine. I, I, I I've I've found that the vast majority of people out there can either teach you how to shoot, and that's usually about it. Yet for me, I'm just as important. It sounds like the way you're talking too. To me, I find just as important as dealing not just with the fight itself and the skill of using a gun, but dealing with the massive aftermath. And that aftermath is, is humongous. And I think that the vast majority of the training world doesn't address that well. And that's why I'm so glad somebody like you can come in with a massive amount of experience and, and talk about that stuff too. Well, there's a... Uh... You know, part of the reason I do what I do is because I've learned to, you You have two fights to win. Uh, the first one's going to be on the street and the second one's going to probably be in court. Uh, no matter how righteous you are, you could, we've, we've seen that. You can have an activist DA that decides to uh, put you up on charges. Uh, no matter how righteous you are, you can end up like, a, you know, I've, I've seen case totally uh, good 
justified shootings, you know, con- legally, morally, ethical, constitutional wise, and, and you end up in federal court with uh, allegations yeah. of civil rights violations and all sorts of things. So, yeah, there, there's two fights you have to win. First one's on the street. You got to live long enough to get sued. And then the second one is you, you get to survive in court and then perhaps twice in court uh, because it could be a criminal case and or a civil case all at the same time. So this is something you talked about. I got to actually take a four-hour training course from you at the Active Self-Protection Conference several mm-hmm. years ago. And then we've kind of co-taught, in a sense, at the same conference. And I yeah. got to tell you, that was one thing you talked about that for me, I found for me after my defensive use of a gun as a cop, that the aftermath is something very few people have prepared me for. And I think the vast majority of shake and bake instructors you're talking about does the same thing. So I appreciated that you did that. And I think that for others that are going out and looking for training, look for not just the shooting skill, but look for the skill of surviving the aftermath too. And if you get the chance, go train with Chuck. the law. Yeah. So uh, uh, Laura and I talked about that uh, on the phone and we talked about, we talked about what we're going to talk about. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that I pointed well, that out was I it, do, <laughs> Well, we, uh, I, I talked about how uh, sometimes you get all kinds of BS, like the difference between, you know, competition is going to get, get you killed in the streets and things like that. Now, I do think there are training modalities that you can engage in that could be somewhat counterproductive on the street. Uh, you, I could tell you if you get into the habit of doing like, you know, absolute max speed splits, uh, if you build drill a guy in real life, after the first couple of shots, the odds yeah. are pretty you know, bad guys not going to be there anymore. And then your rounds are going somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere. So, uh, but, uh, I, I, you, you know, I to that, if you're sh- used to only shooting one every time too, that's another, uh, that's the other side of it, right? It depends. You drill pairs or just shooting once every time you draw that kind of thing. I, well, I, what I see on the what I see on the street is a lot of people panic and go cyclic, and Excessive, they're yeah. they're they're going as fast as they can go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we know is from multiple multiple cases, and you know the science from Four Science Research Center that uh, the the odds are you're going to fire minimum of three to four shots past the point that mm-hmm. you had some sort of stimulus that it was time to stop shooting, like the bad guy disappeared out of your sight picture, that sort of thing. Uh, which which can be a very bad thing. That's how bystanders get hit, allegations of excessive force, things like that occur. Uh, but uh, I know of, quite frankly, I know of very few cases where somebody just fired once or just fired twice and then somehow ended up dead. Uh, that that I can't I can't think of a case where that where I can point to the, something like that happening. But I, I know a lot of them where people went into panic fire mode and then sent rounds down range, sent rounds into bystanders, sent, you know, whatever. Uh, and I know some very high level guys uh, that have had things like that happen. So and anyway, my point of all that was just I'm, I don't buy into the whole you know, street versus competition, competition gets you killed in the street, yada, yada, yada. Don't buy into it. I shoot Mm -hmm. uh, not as active as I, I haven't had the time to be as active as I used to be, but, you know, over the decades I've shot PPC, bullseye, military matches, uh, IDPA, USP. I used to shoot a lot of USPSA in my area because it's all we had. Uh, We didn't have concealed carry in Kansas for a very long time. So IDPA just didn't catch on until that kind of became a thing. But USPSA, Uh, you know, pure match shooters where guys would show up, get their rig out of the bag, jock up, shoot the match, gun goes back in the bag, goes in the trunk. You know, there was no concealed carry culture uh, in in Kansas. So uh, at any rate, I shot USPSA because that's what what there was when and uh, military matches and PPC and things like that. And I uh, I really do believe that competition can give you can give you an edge as long as you're mindful of your venue and then what you're training and how you're training, you know, some of, some of the people that that I tried to emulate, like uh, I was blessed to have Jim Cirillo as a friend before he passed. And he was very, he was kind enough to uh, let much younger, dumber me 
ask him dumb questions on the phone and, and, you know, we could talk over barbecue and things like that when he was in the area and he was a big competitor. Uh, and he was also a big handgun hunter, but, uh, PPC was his thing because that, that was the thing back then, but he was a very high level competition shooter and, uh, fought that, that, and uh, his handgun hunting is what made him very steady when it went live, when he was in the fights that he was in. So, uh, and, there, and there's, there's a bunch of other people like a point to, you know, more, more up to date. My friend, Matt Little, a uh, special forces guy, retired cop, uh, USPSA GM. If you look at, you know, his friend, Frank Proctor, uh, just recently retired special forces dude, USPSA GM. I don't think being a grandmaster held them back as a special forces guy. Man, I just, I'm just going to guess that that wasn't, you know, they, they obviously weren't, you know, killed in Mogadishu because they were grandmaster shooters. Um, so I don't, I don't buy into that idea, but I do think you need to be mindful of what venue you're in and then what tactics and what you're using and things like that. Uh, because I have, you know, I was, I was at training a counterterrorism course at a uh, rich Mason's excellent direct action resource center. And I, we had a guy on my, in my team uh, for that training evolution. That was a military guy who was a GM shooter, got disoriented in the, uh, um, some of the evolutions. And I watched him do friendly fire incidents in, in the middle of a simunitions gunfight. I was in uh, Amos, uh, Craig Douglas's uh, most excellent arm movement and structures course. And I watched, I was watching the final Evo where it's supposed to be, you got a bad guy. And in this case, it, it involved a young lady that was an actor who was your niece. And uh, this guy was a uh, M class IDPA guy rolled through the door and ended up burning down the bad guy and but then shooting his niece four times. Uh, that's a news, you know. Um, so it, I don't necessarily think it's going to get you killed in the street or anything like that, but I do think you have to be very mindful of your training. So what we were talking about on the phone, Laura, was I do see a lot of people do things like fantasy band camp with guns. Uh, and guys want to go repel out of flaming helicopters because that's really cool and it's fun. But I think if you don't have your basic gear and your skills squared away, uh, especially if you're in an armed profession, especially if you're a cop or military guy, something like that. But even if you carry a gun on a daily basis, uh, which most people should, but that's a whole nother conversation. But <laughs> You should have your basic skills, your handgun skills and things like that squared away before you start worried about things like, you know, what kind of uh, matching camouflage do I have on my plate carrier while I go to carbine class? So if I can jump in one more time here, Laura. Sure, um, yeah. If uh, A couple things here. One, you mentioned Jim Carrillo. For those of you watching, if you ever get the chance, go read about that man. That hero right there. I, I think this country owes that man right there a massive debt of gratitude. And the stuff that that man went through is incredible. And then a couple of the others he mentioned, Matt Little um, and a couple others. Right, You should go check those f folks out. Um, but uh, Chuck, you mentioned the bill drill. I got to tell you, in the training that I do, I've more or less thrown that thing away. I see it as a really good indicator of skill, right? It's a good mm -hmm. indicator of skill, but I don't see it as realistic on the on the on the fight in the streets of America, which is what's the vast majority of people have in America. And 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 I'd I'd like your thoughts because I've purposely tossed out of my courses except for just sheer skill demonstration. And uh, I just I just see it as as legalistically in today's logistic America as problematic. A am I wrong in my thinking there? Because I just see it that causing a lot of problems in court. So where I see people having problems is where they get kind of obsessed with a certain thing. Uh, people will be like, OK, I'm going to. Um, and my friend Brian Eastridge and uh, Daryl Bolke call some of the stuff that's out there. And, and uh, you know, I'm friends with some of these instructors, so I'm not trying to kick anybody into gonads. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot of people that want to go out there and, and collect range Pokemon. So I'm going to get this <laughs> award from this shooting class. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to lie. Like when I did Gabe White's class and I was shooting an old ass Gen 3 Glock from duty gear and uh which you know I, I got a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a handicap right there 
and I got a light pin from uh, Gabe Wife's class, just short of a turbo pin. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, that That is what it is. But I see people get kind of obsessed with some of this stuff. And then certain drills are involved in that. And let's say uh, one of those is a build drill. So they'll shoot it over and over and over again. And then, then what they want to do is get really, it, it's like testing for the test. You want to get really yes. good at drills, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, my late friend, Todd Green, famously had the fast test. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and then Ernest Langdon still yep. does the fast coins. Well, it. It's a great, it is a great short test because it is it's a test so what todd cautioned people to do with that is not shoot it over and over and over again but every once in a while you pop up and you shoot it cold because it's a test of where am i at because if you if you think about just the fast test in particular you're going to draw from concealment or from a duty rig you're going to do uh, the two shots to the head box you're going to do an out of battery reload and then you're going to do four fast shots into the the circle on on the chest so what that test is uh is my grip good is my concealed draw or my my duty my can you know uh retention holster if i'm a cop uh is is that scored away did i get a good grip and i'm drawing two low percentage shots so that's a you know the head box at 305 is fairly fairly tight shot then I got to hammer my reload and then I really got to, you know, I got to gas it up to get those four rounds into that chest within, you know, the time hack that I'm trying to make. Let's say I'm trying to make a coin run. So it's test. You don't do it over and over and over again. You do it once or twice cold or at the end of a training session and, and then you call it good and maybe you don't do it for another month or two. So that's where I see something like a bill drill should be because when you look at what does that really test, test your grip, your stance, and uh, make sure your grip's not falling apart under, you know, more than two shots, that kind of thing. So uh, the proper place, I think, for a build drill would be uh, today I'm going to work some speed on the trigger. I'm going to see where I'm at my, on my grip sight trigger. Can I hold, you know, the time hack, the, the standards on a build drill? Maybe you shoot a couple of those. And uh, if you don't do well, then, you know, you know, if you analyze that, why, why did that fall apart? Uh, maybe, you know, traction on my grip or insufficient grip, or uh, I haven't worked with that holster enough. Maybe I got a crappy grip out of the holster because I don't have proper ride height in my holster. What, whatever the case may be, you look at why you did poorly, revisit that some other time. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of good drills out there, you know, uh, Cooper's got some, obviously, uh, Bill Wilson's got a few, Ken Hackthorne, you know, Hackthorne and Bickers uh, set up things like the test. Uh, if you look at the test, that's, that's yes. a 10 round event. But what, what is that? What is that test? You know, do we shoot? Is it realistic to shoot 10 round strings all on the same target on the street? Probably not. I would hope if you'd put three, four, five, into a guy's torso and he's still up and in the fight you get the idea that you really need to change channels. Maybe you need to go for a headshot or pelvis shot or whatever the case may be, you know, what's appropriate to the scenario. But so we don't shoot the test. You don't, you know, work up to shoot 10 round strings. That's a test. So use correctly. I think, uh, things like build drills, fast test, uh, I learned some some outstanding ones, a couple of really good ones from uh, Justin Dial a couple of weekends ago. I was down in Dallas uh, training with Justin Dial. He, that was an outstanding class. Um, the these things are are good for measurement, uh, and they're not necessarily scenario based. Where uh, like what you're talking about with a build drill, obviously not, not necessarily a scenario where, okay, I'm going to draw as fast as I can. And I'm going to try hammer six into this dude before what he falls, things like that. And with your, with your experience, Adam, you know, what happens after the first shot? Yeah, Every, people start to go down. If everybody's moving in one yeah. way, shape or form, if your dude is still on his feet, if he's not disabled or diminished, he's going to be moving. He's not going to stand still and let him, you know, be a cooperative cardboard target and let you shoot him. So that's where I find things like, uh, 
moving from one dot to the next, we did that in Justin Dial's class or maybe a half pres or an L pres, things like that, where, where you have some variety in some of this stuff. Uh, I think, <laughs> truthfully, I think one of, one of the most realistic, if you want to get into competition widgets that maybe good practice for a gunfight would be a Texas star. Because if you get a hit or if you get a bad hit or things start moving, nobody's shooting six shots on a Texas star as fast as they do on a bill drill. You just can't do it. Uh, and then what do you have to do after you hit the first shot? You have to mentally adjust to something that's slightly moving and where am I going from there? And I know high level competitors will kind of game it. Okay, I'm going to, you know, I know to start here and then I'm going to work my way through that. But the whole thing is still moving at some point. So I think that's kind of a somewhat realistic approximation of a live target because if you hit your dude, he's going to be moving. Maybe he's dropping, maybe he's moving to the side, maybe he's flinching, whatever the case may be, but there's going to be movement involved. That's I think that's that's so crucial what all you just said, right? It's instead of becoming a uh, a, a really good at one specific drill or two specific drills is being the generalist all around with a quality amount of skill and really being a thoughtful shooter, right? If you're going to shoot in defensive life, you've got to be thoughtful about it and understand the difference between competition and running a certain drill all the time and being able to vary things. And uh, man, you just said that well. So I'll back out, but I'm so glad you're here and happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. Happy birthday. Okay. So, oh, wait, let me get back on here. Um, all right. We're running out of time, Chuck. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you like a, I forget what they call it. The fast. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But we're in the final final stretch here, guys. So if you have questions for Chuck, put those in the comments and we'll get to those here in a little bit. So Chuck, tell me, let me get back to my questions because Adam got me thrown off there. Um, tell me from your perspective in law enforcement, what is one of the most common ways that people get themselves in trouble? Just general everyday people getting themselves in trouble and then the event escalating and then you end up having to show up on the scene. What is the most common thing oh, that they man. do wrong? Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see is when people are in their house and something is going on outside, maybe a car bur burglary or, uh, you know, a trespass or something like that. And then they go outside and there's a confrontation outside. If, you, if you're, if you're bunkered up in the house, don't go, don't go outside unless you have uh I don't know, somebody kidnapping your spouse or your child or some other life safety thing, but uh, people getting their cars broken into, trespassers, things like that. I see people leave the house. It turns into a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I can already hear people saying, well, you know, I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes bad guys use tactics. We had some bad guys that were here in Topeka that were running a crew they were doing nighttime burglaries where they're breaking into people's houses in the middle of the night and uh they would have a dude post up on the hallway with the bedrooms in case you got up uh, and everybody else would like haul all the electronics off and then on we have a lot of split level houses here so you got like a two-story roof and then a one-story garage well they boost a dude up on the low roof with a shotgun because they had had they had a case one time where a, a dog chased one of the guys in the backyard. The owner came out back. Um, they, they ended up killing the guy's dog. The, the owner ran back inside the house, but uh, they had a bad guy. What they started doing, we found out, was putting a bad guy on the, if they had a low roof, putting a bad guy on the roof. So think about this. You're going to go outside the door to go confront mm -hmm. bad guys that you see, and you don't know that they've got a partner that's got a shotgun behind you. Mm -hmm. You can't win that. <clears throat> you certainly can't right. win that by yourself. That That's just mm -hmm. dumb. I have mm -hmm. seen people take what would have probably been a good defensive shooting if somebody had broken into the house, but they go outside to confront the person before the break-in actually occurs. And then there's a, a shooting on the porch or in the front yard, and that turns it into a manslaughter trial, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I know of one case where Guy went outside because he thought somebody was breaking into his car. It's dark. He tells the guy to stop. The guy's walking towards him. He shoots the dude. It turns out to be an Alzheimer's patient that uh, had wandered mm -hmm. off from a facility. I don't know how you live with that. You know, that's how wow. that's where you 
an alcoholic and, you know, drink yourself to death kind of thing. So leaving the house, that's dumb. Mm-hmm. Road rage, getting getting involved in road rage and then getting out of the car and because you're going to have some sort of confrontation or tell people, you know, what you think of whatever uh, is also just dumb as hell. So in general, getting emotionally involved in, in BS, getting emotionally involved in disputes with stupid people is mm-hmm. stupid. So if you're going to run around with a gun and you're not going to be a criminal, things that you have to ask yourself are, are is what I'm about to get involved in worth me dying for? Is it worth me killing for? Is it worth me going to prison for? Is it worth me getting sued? And then somebody else is living in my house and driving my car. Mm-hmm. That's every, very every, well said. To, to steal a line from my friend Wayne Dobbs, every time you strap on a gun, you're making a life and death and financial decision. It's the, that's, that's the harsh reality of the world. Mm-hmm. So uh, th- those are glaring, glaring mistakes. Uh, the other thing I see is uh, when we have home defense things, I don't know how many times I've heard of cases where somebody hears a, you know, some sort of bump in the night and they think they got a burglary and that they shoot at the person and it turns out to be a family member or something like that. Because we know mm-hmm. teenagers will do things like sneak out and go drink beer with their friends and then try to sneak back in the house and not get caught and that sort of thing. So not putting as much skill into tactics and use of a flashlight in a low light scenario is something that uh, has caused some tragedy. Uh, and then we see a lot of untrained people. That, that's a conversation my friend uh, uh, Claude Warner and I, the tactical professor, if you don't pay attention to Claude, you should. That's literally his blog is the tactical professor. Like William, he's another 90 pound brain. So uh, that's something that, that Claude and I have talked about is the, the, number the number of people who are successful in defensive encounters with firearms with no training it's very very high mm-hmm. but they also are the vast majority of representation of people in all of these what he calls negative outcomes shootings that never should have happened the guy that leaves the house the guy that gets into the road rage shooting and ends up on a manslaughter charge the the guy that shoots his 16 year old daughter sneaking into the house all of these are also the untrained people as well. So you're, you're, I think your survival quotient goes up the more training you have. Uh, I think your your odds of a negative outcome go down the more training you have, the better training you have. A couple more things, and this this is sort of a part of that. I think this needs to be said, and I know you're not a lawyer, so I'm not asking you for legal advice, Chuck, but you've seen a thing or two. And this gets asked in I've seen I've seen this many times get asked in classes. Usually it starts out with a scenario of some kind where the student says, well, but what if this happens and then da, 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 and then then am I justified? Right. We get those scenarios all the time. And I think it's important for us to for you, if you wouldn't mind, to be clear with people about the use of lethal force versus the legal use of non-lethal force. There is, I've heard a lot of people um, not agree with, and it doesn't matter if you agree with it or not, it's the law. um, Don't agree with, well, I should be able to use lethal force in defense of my property. And then they want to know, well, what does that exactly entail? Does it mean my dog? Does it not mean my dog? They're like a family member to me. I'm sure you've heard all of these conversations before, but I think that this is important and and should be addressed. So in broad strokes, uh, you can use physical force. Let's say a punch in the nose or pepper spray, obviously to to fend yourself from physical force. One of the the reasons I'm an advocate for OC is, is that it allows you to apply physical force to another person from a distance. It's effective against people and dogs. So uh, can you defend your dog from another dog utilizing pepper spray? Yeah, you can, you can you defend yourself against a dog and avoid launching rounds in an urban environment. Let's say you're out for a bike ride or something, and you end up having to spray a dog. Is it better to spray the dog or shoot the dog and risk mm-hmm. launching bullets in an urban environment? Yeah, I think that, that, that question answers itself. So you can, you can utilize physical force to defend property. 
everywhere. You can't use deadly force to defend property. You can only use deadly force when you are under reasonable fear of death or great bodily harm or somebody that you're responsible for, say a family member, spouse, child, something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so another, another place that I would direct people to do some deep reading because people, people hit me with the scenario. So if da, 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 can I shoot him? Like they're looking for an excuse and Mm -hmm. there is no bright line. There is no black and white. You get very few scenarios of, you know, when, when I'm doing thought experiments with people, if I were to roll through the door as a cop during the Columbine event, and those two shooters were standing in the library next to a pile of bodies holding smoking shotguns, can I shoot them? Well, very clearly, but do we get things that are that unambiguous? Typically, no, it's the, the world is far, far more shades of gray than, than that kind of bright black and white or green light scenario. Mm-hmm. So we got to think about that. Um, and can you shoot them? Can is, I don't know. Can you, my idea <laughs> if you squared away your mindset and your skills and things like that. Uh, but, uh, there's a, <laughs> or it's common to say just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. That's where I was going next, Chuck. You just go, um, you just keep going. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine that, uh, so I would tell people to look up the site Modern Service Weapons. The couple of my friends used to run. It's now kind of an archive, but there is an article written there uh, by a friend that I, I can't give you his real name because he, he's still an active uh, dude, very high level. He has to write under a pen name because he's still in the ju- judicial system. But uh, trust me, he's he's got a lot a lot of experience uh, in the judicial system at a very high level. And he wrote an article called uh, The Paradigm of Deadly Force. It's can, may, should, must. Mm -hmm. So legally, the may is, what what does the law say you can do? At the point you are in reasonable fear of death and or great bodily harm, you can utilize deadly force to stop that attack. The thing is, a jury has to agree with you. A DA's office has to agree. People think I was in fear for my life is some sort of magic get out of jail free phrase or free card like, you know, in Monopoly. And it's not. It has to be reasonable. And a jury or the DA's office and a grand jury or a jury have to agree with you that it was reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. So uh, may And then we get into uh, what he calls should. So if you have a scenario, you're like, yeah, I really should uh, shoot this guy. And I I point this out as a cop. I don't know how many times I had a dude at gunpoint that under the letter of the law, I could have legally shot and didn't because it just hadn't really crossed that line for me yet. I could tell you, uh, especially in the, the 80s and 90s when things like when the crack wars were going on and boys in the hood was like my 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 thing every day when I went on patrol. If I'd shot everybody that I could have shot may, under the May paradigm, I would have got nothing else done. I would have got into a shooting, gone through a two, three, four week uh, post shooting investigation, got back on the street. A couple days later, would have shot somebody else and repeated the process over and over again for 20, 30 years. Uh, so that's where, uh, he wrote the may and then the should part and then the must. So I would agree if we go back to my scenario of you, if you rolled through the door of the library at Columbine, or you see, you know, Charles Manson with a bloody machete on a kindergarten playground, you pretty much legally, morally, ethically, you should probably shoot that guy as quickly as possible. But you have to look at these scenarios at, is it a may, is it a should, is it a must? Uh, and then then you're going to have to get a, a DA's office, probably a grand jury, maybe maybe a, a criminal and panel jury to, to agree with your decision. But that article is something I would caution people to read more than once. Hmm. That's really good. Okay, one more thing, and then I'll let you go if you're okay with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm perfect. Okay. All right. So along the lines of just because you can doesn't mean maybe you should. This is a is 
it honestly should not be controversial at all, but I've had so many conversations about this with uh, students. And so I, I just wanted to highlight this coming from somebody with your experience level, just because you can open carry in a state, does that mean you should? So obviously in a uniform capacity, I have open carried for a very long time because that, that is, that's the expectation. That's how, that's how cops and military do things. So I've open carried, I have always open carried in the, the most robust secure holster that I could get my hands on early in my career. If we go back to the seventies and the eighties, uh, the cops being victims of gun grabs and getting shot with their own gun has always been with the police service. So if we go back to the 70s and 80s when security holsters weren't quite what they are now, training wasn't quite what it is now, somewhere in the order of 20 to 25% of all of the law enforcement officers feloniously murdered in the line of duty were killed with their own gun. Think about that. One out of three, Crazy. one out of five were killed with their own gun. So having your gun unconcealed is a tactical disadvantage. And we try to mitigate that with good training, extensive training, and with a very heavy duty, high quality holster. Uh, a lot of cops are running around with level three safari land rigs and, and you know, rigs of, of equal quality because of that. Uh, so the other thing I would tell you is, is that gives the bad guy the option of the first move. Uh, going back to William April again, him and I were having long conversations about this uh, before he passed. Just in New Orleans, where he lived, he had documented 28 incidents of open carry people who were specifically targeted for and robbed of their firearm. So what will happen is they get spotted. They got a, they got a firearm. Uh, a dude or two or three decide they're going to go relieve you of your, of your firearm. So uh, I, I have people talk a lot of bluster, but if you have a guy walks up and sticks a gun in your face while another dude is removing your gun out of the holster, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to do a cool move, pull out a backup yeah. gun, have a hideout. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. your, they're, they're going to take your gun and you'll be lucky if you don't get shot in the face during the process. So I'm a firm believer in you should have the legal right to do so because I know there's, there, there's like, there's been States, I think Texas was that way for a while, uh, which is disappointing of Texas. I'm kind of ashamed of you for that, but uh, where you could have concealed carry, but if your gun showed in public, like let's say heavy gust of wind blew your coat open and people could see your gun that you could get arrested for that because it wasn't concealed and open carry wasn't legal. Well, that's just stupid. I think you should have the legal right to open carry, but I think tactically it doesn't make any sense at all outside of, I'm going to go hunting, yeah. uh, training on the range, things like that. Uh, tactically, the, the, it gives the bad guy the option of, the only people you're scaring away are the people that you really don't have to worry about. The really hardened bad guys, do you, do you think that they haven't seen guns before? Do you think they haven't had guns pulled on them? Do you think they don't want to be the next 50 cent that is able to brag about multiple bullet holes that they've survived? That's a lot of street cred for guys like that. And the hardened criminals are not going, you're not establishing a crime-free bubble by walking around with a visible firearm. And then the fact of the life is, is that most people that I see running around with open carry have rigs that are pathetic that they won't survive a gun grab. They won't survive a fight. They won't retain the gun in a fight. Uh, and they're certainly not spending the last, I looked at a level three safari land duty holster, something like on the order of 180 bucks. Most people are not, you know, a lot of people don't even want to spend 30 bucks, 40 bucks on a holster from what I've seen. So quality gear really matters. Uh, on top of that, being diligent, there's a specific study of how to do weapon retention training. There's very few trainers out there doing that. I do it. Uh, guys like Paul Sharp, my friend Cecil Birch, uh, uh, Craig Douglas uh, covers that in his, in his excellent uh, ECQC classes, things like that. Most of the trainers I've seen, and certainly most of the firearms trainers I see, are not covering that. Like, how do you retain your gun if you're jumped for your gun when you're when you're carrying open carry? They 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 just don't cover it. 
So not just Williams 28 cases, but uh, you know, I've, I've documented a bunch of cases where people have been robbed, targeted for and robbed of their gun. So I think it's, if I got to pull my gun, I want it to be a surprise that the bad guy didn't see coming, just didn't see mm-hmm. coming. Um, so that's. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. As, as we, uh, we, we had the conversation on the phone, I, I pointed out in my state, uh, there is no law that like, uh, what people would think of as indecent exposure. So oh, yeah. legally I can walk around with no <laughs> pants on. I can legally <laughs> walk around with no pants on, Yeah. but just because I can, doesn't mean I should that, you know, that that's there. There's just things that are that are should be common sense, but sadly they're not. I know that some people are going to find what I've said offensive, and I'm somehow anti Second Amendment that sort of thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I think there's a lot of tactical disadvantages to uh, open carry that people haven't really put thought into. And if you're going to do it, you really need to do it right. You need to be diligent about things like uh, a proper belt, uh, gear selection, that sort of thing. I had a friend four days ago who's a, a Metropolitan Police officer. He was jumped for his gun and in the fight, his uh, Safari Land duty rig, he had a you know, $180 holster, eventually broke in the fight and he took a bullet in the leg from his own gun before he managed to kill the bad guy. So if you think about that uh, and the fact that most people don't buy the top rated retention holsters when they're, when they're out there open carrying and that sort of thing, they're really leaving themselves at a disadvantage in uh, very realistic scenarios. So well said. I just can't believe I only get an hour. This is just unfair, but that's okay. Um, so, Chuck, if somebody wants to train with you, uh, what do you have coming up? Where will you be and where can they find out more about you? So, my my website is, uh, my company is Agile Training and Consulting. And the paradigm of my training, most of my training is, I do have stuff that's packaged. And I don't want to sound like I'm bashing on other instructors. Like my friend Pat Rogers, uh, one of my mentors, he had a carbine operators course. So if you go to carbine operators course, you know, you're going to go for three days. You're going to have, you know, day one, two, three. If you were to go to that class next year, there would be some development, but you would know I'm going to go to this package of a class. I do have some classes like that, but a lot of my training that I do, particularly local stuff, things that I've done for agencies or private clients, that sort of thing is look at it's entirely client driven needs. So uh, Craig Douglas helped me pick the name for my company. Agile is a project that can change on a dime. You know, you can turn on a dime. So I look at client needs and what, what they want, what they need. And I put training packages together for people. I do have some standardized classes that I do that I kind of gear towards whoever's hosting me, what they're looking for, that sort of thing. So uh, the next thing I'm doing is Revolver Roundup, the Pat Rogers Memorial Revolver Roundup at the famous gun site facility. So I'm privileged to be an instructor uh, at, you know, to be teaching at the legendary gun site facility. There's still, if anybody wants to spend three days learning everything there is to know about revolvers, uh, there are still a few spots open for revolver roundup at gun site. Past that, I'll be down in the, the Murfreesboro, Tennessee, teaching my OC instructor course that I developed for, uh, specifically for, it was by request, uh, of the non-cop world to come up with something that was not a police centric uh, OC instructor course. So I'm teaching that uh, with my friend, uh, uh, Akil down there. uh, uh, Citizen safety Academy is his outfit down there in Murfreesboro. So Hawk has hosted me for that and a uh, uh, combative handgun class. I got some other, I got some stuff coming up locally here. uh, Low light classes, my small guns class is a very popular one. I've got some more OC instructor. I saw Robin was in the comments. I'm teaching at a yeah. girl and a gun at the national girl and a gun conference. I'll be teaching at uh, the tactical conference in Dallas again. And uh, so my website is uh, agile tactical.com. I couldn't get, <laughs> you have to get what the internet domain name gods are going to give you. So yeah. agile training was already taken by somebody. So, uh, agile tactical.com is my website and my, I try to keep my training calendar 
on all my open courses is up to date as possible. So uh, if anyone's interested, I got Facebook, uh, I've got under my name and my, my agile training consulting, I've got uh, the, uh, my website as well. So, you know, you can email me or message me on, on the hit my DMs, that kind of thing. <laughs> Is that how you say it? <laughs> I, that's what I hear the kids are talking about nowadays. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know the lingo, to be honest. So, I, Chuck, I any either. parting thoughts? That's <laughs> okay. We know what you mean. We put it all up. Adam put it all up at the bottom of the screen so you guys know right where to find him. Um, be sure to reach out to him if you're interested in any of his training. I, I just love Chuck. I don't see how anybody couldn't. Um, so any parting thoughts for especially the people out there who this might be the first time they've ever seen you and maybe some of the things that you've said tonight are new to them. What are some of the things you'd like to leave them with as far as just general ideas of staying safe in the world we live in today as an everyday civilian? Most people give some sort of lip service to mindset and situational awareness without actually practicing that. Uh, th those two right there will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Um, following Farnham's device of don't go do stupid things with stupid people in stupid places. Um, you know, Tom Gibbons famously says that he's done a lot of research and found that almost 100 percent of bar fights occur in bars. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the Far Farnham's. Uh, admonition holds up. Uh, the other thing is I firmly believe software trumps hardware that having, you, you don't have to have a staccato with, you know, the newest iteration of a Trigicon site and a, a light and a 24 round magazine. It, uh, that whole, you're going to get killed in the streets thing is, is just utter BS. If we look at what's really important is, uh, have a gun, actually carry your gear and actually have it with you in an emergency. Uh, there's all kinds of gunfights that occurred where what the gun was, what the ammo in the gun was, things like that just didn't matter. It's the fact that the person had the expertise and the software on board and had their tools with them when the balloon went up. That that's the important thing. I think I firmly believe software trumps hardware. That training is more important than the gear you have. Uh, I'll point out we, we go back to Jim Cirillo. Guys like Jim Cirillo did a lot of good work with a six shot thirty eight or five shot thirty eight revolver and some non. You know they didn't even have hollow, hollow points back then. So um, some of the legendary gunfighters out there. How many? Uh, People will watch like the Highwaymen with uh, Frank Hammer when they were uh, tracking down Bonnie and Clyde. That was a pretty popular movie a few years ago. Guess what? Frank Hammer never had. He didn't have a staccato and he didn't have jagged hollow points, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But he had a lot of mindset and he had a lot of software. He had a lot of marksmanship uh, on board. So I would tell people that training in this community, I think, is overvalued and that hardware is... Uh, I mean, training is undervalued, okay. hardware yeah. is overvalued. You know, what do people put pictures of on their Instagram page? Brand new gun, brand new stocks, things like that. Um, not a lot of people put their certificates up. Hey, I just, you know, graduated from whatever high speed operator course, you know, uh, maybe you actually did repel out of flaming helicopters. That's something to be proud of. <laughs> uh, but I, I firmly believe software trumps hardware. But I also believe carry your gear. You know, um, Tom Gibbons' mm. admonition was that uh, he had the last I knew 68 concealed carry students who have won the fight that they were offered, carjacking, robbery, things like that. He's had zero losses and three defaults. And what he means by that is three of his students, unfortunately, were not armed on the day that they got elected by a bad guy to be a victim. And they were murdered during the course of a robbery, carjacking, that sort of thing. Pat Rogers uh, famously talked about a couple of his students, unfortunately, who had been to a, one of his courses, just spent three days shooting a lot of ammo and uh, got pretty proficient. And then they loaded up all their stuff in the truck and uh, they go to the stop and rob to 
get gas on their road trip. Yeah, what do you do on a road trip? Get gas and snacks. Well, at the gas pump, they got jacked. One of them got killed and the other one got wounded and ended up in the ICU. Where was their gear? All packed up in the bags in the back of the truck. So uh, Pat would very famously say, carry your effing gun. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, he was not quite as nice about that, but uh, mm -hmm. carry your gear. Get trained up and then carry your gear. That is so crazy that you said that because today when I went to town, you know, I go to town often and I just put my pepper spray in my pocket there and I thought, you know what, I don't have time to put my gun, I'll just go. And I stopped myself and I was like, no, it's it takes you 30 seconds, you know, and but these are things, I mean, probably you don't think about this and maybe other people that are watching, but seriously, I mean, it takes you 30 seconds to put it on. Just, just so put it on. That's, that's one of the reasons why I teach one of my specialty courses is my small guns course. And I teach me myself, uh, you know, Wayne Dobbs, uh, Daryl Bolke, some of my other friends, uh, like snub 38 revolvers, that sort of thing. Because people will think, well, you know, this isn't like five shot 38 in the serious gun or like Glock 42, 380 in the serious gun, et cetera, et cetera. You got to have this. You know, right right now, the new hotness is a staccato. It used to be you had to have a Glock 34 with a light, and now you got an an optic, and you got to have a 2011-type pistol. Otherwise, you're just, you know, dead in the streets. And that's demonstrably BS. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems I see, especially with new people, is, is they get this uh, counsel, so they just give up. They're like, hey, well, this is such a you know, just screw it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about it anymore because it's just such a pain in the ass. Uh, I was tactical most of my life. You know, I, I counter people, you have to carry this or else. Well, you know, maybe if you're not wearing a plate carrier, run around with your carbine at low ready with uh, your night vision ready to go. You're just not taking life seriously, which is, you know, <laughs> yes. Uh, every once in a while you want to wear board shorts and flip flops and maybe take a vacation, you know, chill out. Uh, so I will kind of profile where I'm going and what I'm doing. Sometimes I've gone, you know, I'll go on like when I, when I went on vacation to Belize, couldn't take a gun is what it is, but I'm going to live my life. I don't live my life for the gear. The gear enhances my life and my ability to do things. I don't live my life for the gear. The gear is a tool. So I don't get emotionally invested in it. But one of the, one of the the entry level problems I see in this business is that kind of advice, and think about where you know what you were talking about. If you felt good with your skills and your abilities, you know the capability of your gear. If you had something like one of my buddies, uh, uh, Tom Kelly with Darstar Gear, or, you know I'm friends with uh, John Hotman of Filster. They have some very handy, very small, very concealable holsters. They have the, the clip type attachments that are very uh, secure on a belt, easy on, easy off. Think about if you could grab that package, clip it into your waistband and go. Uh, back in the day, we used to call a snub 38 and a pocket holster the, I got to go to the store and get a jug of milk gun. That, that's what that was for is I got to run to the store and get a jug of milk. Uh, I, I, yeah, the, where people didn't want to jock up, strap on all their stuff just to go do this chore, right? So are you going to be way better off with a Snub 38 in your pocket or a Glock 42 in an appendix rig if you are getting jacked while you're out there on this quick errand to go get a jug of milk or whatever? Are you going to be better off with that or without it? And then how much more likely are you to have this gear if it's comfortable, convenient, et cetera. Are you going to wish you had a bigger gun? Maybe, but I've not, I, I can't point to, I, I don't personally know of, and I can't point to cases in the concealed carry world where somebody got dead because they had a five shot 38 or they had a, you know, seven shot, eight shot Glock 42, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and some of these, some of these little guns like the Ruger LCP max, you can have 13 rounds on board. That's crazy. You know? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Heck when, when I started in police work, it was standard to have, you had your six shooter and a holster and two speed loaders. You had 18 rounds on your person total. And we were expected to go out, crush crime and or evil and make the world safer democracy, you know? Um, so at any rate, 
I teach a small guns class and I know other guys that do that because I think there's a very real world need for guns that are convenient and comfortable that we can have with us in a wide variety of clothing and a wide variety of circumstances that are truly concealed that are a surprise when the bad guy um, picks a wrong victim. So mm -hmm. yeah, you made me, uh, <laughs> yeah, your, your little story there made me start preaching. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you've got quotables for days, Chuck. I mean, you could write an entire book just with quotes in it from Chuck Haggard. I mean, it's just one well, right after the other. I learned, I learned uh, when I was running my program at my department for a while, and I had some, uh, some younger dudes that were my AIs for my firearms instructor program. And I found out that they had a spiral bound notebook at the back of the class that they would write down Chuckisms uh, yeah. when I would say something and they would write them down because they were yeah. thought they were particularly humorous or whatever the yeah. case may be. So Adam has some of those too. I feel like, I feel like Bill Murray and Caddyshack when he said, <laughs> oh, I've, got, I've got that going for me, which is nice. <laughs> oh man. I am so, so fortunate that you agreed to come on this show, Chuck. You've just been a pleasure to, to have on. I mean, gosh, we've just like, barely dipped our toe in the water of the the experience expertise and wisdom that you have to offer and we're just so thankful for that um yeah and we could just keep going guys but i understand we're over the hour uh tell me in the comments if you enjoy this as much as i did uh chuck is there anything else that you want to leave people with before we go because we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here i promise really this time we are <laughs> um no, I, I, I think, <laughs> I think I went off you on a couple of things there. <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, okay. So I, I will say I get hit with people think, oh, well, you're just trying to say, you're just trying to sell training. And what I tell you is uh, if, if you don't train with me, train with somebody, train with some quality instructors somewhere yeah. you can, you can yeah. find people like that. Uh, like, and then there's, there's great organizations where you can dip your toe in the water, uh, rage master tactical conference. Uh, -huh. Robin's, uh, excellent. If, if it's one of the ladies, her girl in a gun organization and that national girl in a gun conference, um, things like that, where you can, you can dip your toe in the water and, and get a feel for some of these instructors in these short courses and be like, Hey, I like this person or I don't like this person. And uh, maybe I want to go train with this person or whatever the case may be. So there, there's, there's ways to get into some of that. And truthfully, I steer yeah. business to other people. I have a very poor business model and I steer people to other instructors all the time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if one of your that questions. probably means you care about your people. You care about you, uh, people more than you care about money. It sounds like. Well, uh, Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not getting rich doing this. Um, and you don't you definitely don't get rich as a cop. Uh, and if you are a cop and you're getting rich, then you are under investigation <laughs> very quickly, uh, as it should be. But you know, one of the things I'll tell people is if if you hit me up with a question and it is, hey, I'm in uh, I live in Timbuktu. Do you know any good instructors around there? If I do, I'll tell you. So I'll tell you if you don't train with me, trade with somebody. Sounds like our Montana crowd wants to get you up here. So we might have to make that happen. That would be fun. I've never been to Montana, so that would be <gasps> kick ass. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay. Well, we got to do that then. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you go for now, Chuck. Again, thank you so much. It was just such a pleasure. Had so much fun um, and almost got through all the questions. <laughs> it, it was my pleasure entirely. All right. Thank you. You're All right, guys. So let's wrap up for the night. I think this is the longest interview that, that I've ever done. So, um, but I mean, how could it not, how could you just not keep going with Chuck? I mean, yeah, wonderful interview. So really quickly before we wrap up, I'm going to tell you um, about what to expect on the Defenders Live community. And then I'm going to tell you what to expect for next week, just so you know what's going on now. Um, so thank you to everyone who has supported the Defenders Live community on Locals.com. Um, what to expect 
coming up on that channel is first, I'm going to be hosting a roundtable discussion about mental and emotional management and mind body connection. And hopefully this will help improve not only your shooting on the range, but uh, also in your everyday life. Uh, I really feel like that's important and something that needs to be touched on. So we're going to be having more of that coming down the line, as well as a series of deep dive interviews deeper than what I normally do like on my public channel. I'm going to put these deep dive interviews on the locals.com channel and I'm going to introduce you to some incredibly uh, special and inspirational women that I know um, that I think you'll find what they have to say very valuable, very powerful, and they've got some incredible stories that I would like to share with all of you. So if you're interested in checking any of that out, um, you can join that Defenders Live community at Locals.com. Go to the Discover tab and search up Defenders Live, and that's where you can find that. Next week, we are going to have Steve Tarani um, back on the show. He's going to be talking about his new program called Prefence. And um, if you have any topics, specific topics or questions that you'd like uh, me to talk to Steve about next week, you can email me at laura at defenders-usa.com. L-O-R-A is how you spell my first name, laura at defenders-usa.com. Looking forward to seeing all you beautiful people next Wednesday. Same time, same place, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And it'll be Mountain Standard Time, I think, next week. So we'll see you then. Until then.